Welcome to the Western Minnesota Steam Thrashers Reunion at Rolog, Minnesota. This is year 2004. We are going to get ourselves a new 50B Messiah's Erie Steam Shovel this year, and this is one of the first 75 ton cranes coming in to help download it. Well, this is the first first one of the three loads of the sh of the steam shovel come in. That was the house on the first picture. The second one is the tracks or the turntable, and there's the boom and the dipper for it. It just made a thousand mile vo voyage to get here from Petersburg, Kentucky. You can see there's the house sitting there on the trailer. It weighs approximately 25 ton. You can see how they got it blocked up to clear the gear that turns the turntable underneath and several chains and there's the track assembly it, it weighs about 20 ton and there you can see the track assembly and there's the center pin that keeps the house <coughs> centered on the on the gears on the gear there that that's what turns your t uh, house around and around it uh, and that the center pin through there there's a shaft that goes through there that brings the power down to drive the tracks here you can see that pin that shaft turns the bevel gear it's down below there's a picture that shows the top of the turntable where the rollers run that support the house there's a nut that holds the turn a house down that nut measures about six inches across it shows that square shaft must be about six inches square. Everything on it takes a, two good men to carry. And there you can see the bevel gears that transfer the power over to drive the tracks. It's a very well-built piece of machinery, real heavy. There's a good view of the, of the angle drive to drive the main shaft that turns the tracks. There's the bevel gear that's driven from the shaft coming down from the house. Here's a picture of uh, with the, the crane with its outriggers out, looking up the boom. This gentleman here with the mustache, his, his name is Dennis Wheats. He was one of the drivers that uh, helped deliver the 50B. The cranes were furnished, as you can see, by industrial builders out of Fargo, North Dakota. Industrial builders out of Fargo, North Dakota, uh, during the assembly, they has helped us assemble the 50B, and uh, part of their time was donated to Rolog for this project. Here we are uh, chaining up the track system. We have to get a turn, a half a turn, so it is going in the right direction. From the hook, they're putting down uh, slings. Once they get tight, they will uh, lift it up and we will turn it one half turn. The approximate weight of the, the track system is about 20 ton. The crane is, as you can see, is lifting the track system up and we will take and uh, turn this its half turn so the drive is on the right end when we have it all completely assembled Thank you. 
Here we have the second load getting ready, or I should say being backed in, which is the house part, getting ready for assembly. You'll move this in fairly tight up against the track systems. We'll be using uh, both cranes. The second crane that you'll be, see, be seeing is a 60-ton. Uh, Here we have a uh, couple people. One is Harvey Peller from uh, down at uh, Petersburg, Kentucky, hooking up a shackle with one of the slings, which will be used to uh, lift the house off the low boy trailer. This is another one, be uh, another shackle being assembled with the sling. We'll be using uh, four slings, one in each corner, both cranes. Here's a picture of the 60 ton. By Cyrus Foundry and Manufacturing was founded in 1880 by Dan P. Ellis and Associates. By 1889, the company had changed its names to By Cyrus Steam Shovel and Dredge Company. Originally located in By Cyrus, Ohio, the company moved to South Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1893. The company built its first steam shovel in 1882. By Cyrus' arch rival, Marion, got its start in 1883 with steam shovel operator Henry M. Barnhart of Marion, Ohio. Unhappy with many of the available shovels of the day, he decided to build a better one, and he enlisted the help of his friend Edward Huber of the Huber Manufacturing Company, which was also located in Marion, Ohio. The race between the two companies was on and did not end until By Cyrus purchased Marion to become By Cyrus International in 1997. Today they produce a variety of earth moving machines that are sold all around the world. By Cyrus produced 37 different model types of the larger railroad shovels between 1882 and 1929. This number did not include the smaller full revolving rail mounted machines. The largest was the 95 ton 5 cubic yard shovel built in 1899. Here uh, we're dropping the second hook down. As you've seen just previous to this, we dropped the first hook down and hooked the slings. The gentleman in the white t-shirt is Bill Rudisill of Petersburg, Kentucky, which was the owner of the 50B. He's the one that, in the white t-shirt, as I said, he'll be hooking up the slings. See a picture of the slings laying up against some wood blocking, which is to keep the slings away from the top of the house because there's tin that hangs over. The reason that we are using two cranes is so we don't have to use a spreader bar across the top with one crane. And also for assembly, this makes it a lot easier to uh, control the house when setting it back on the track system. It keeps it, you can uh, keep it from wiggling back and forth. You can raise one end, lower the other, swing it left or right, which like I said, makes assembly a lot easier. Here we are uh, moving the house over to uh, put it on the center pin. There's uh, several people that are holding it up. They probably think they're Goliaths, but uh, maybe they are. It looks like they're doing fairly well. As you can see, the house was moving around. We have to get it steady. Here uh, we are lowering the house down onto the center pin. As you can see, there is a square shaft there. We're slowly bringing it down. Here, I think, is where we run into a little bit of trouble. We have to get the square shaft to fit in, as they say, in a square hole. As you can see, the house is... There it went! <laughs> Bounces a little bit on them slings, but down she went.
have the drive gear that will run the driven gear. This has to be in mesh. Because this is what uh, propels the house to turn it left or right or to go completely around. You can see uh, two rollers that run on top of the, the drive gear. I should say the driven gear. Here they're checking to see if uh, the drive gear is in mesh. Which it appears that it is. The shovel in this video is the popular two yard 50B model which was first introduced in 1922. It had a full swing 360 capacity. It was offered in a steam version either coal or oil fired as an electric powered shovel or as a diesel engine machine. The model was built until 1937. In 1927, the Erie Steam Shovel Company merged into the By Cyrus Erie Company. The By Cyrus Erie 50B that we see in this film was built in 1929. It could be used as a shovel, a drag light, a clamshell, or a crane. Approximate working weight was 71 ton. It has a side fired boiler of a locomotive type. The house moves when the shovel is in transport because it is not attached but sits on the pivot point so that it can make the 360 degree turn. This shovel is currently the largest operating coal fired shovel in North America. An oil fired 50B is on display in California but is not in running order. 534 units were produced. Specifications of the 50B revolving steam driven shovel. All steel castings were made of basic open hearth annealed steel having tensile strength of 65,000 to 75,000 pounds per square inch made at the By Cyrus foundry. Dipper capacity was 2 cubic yards. Length of the boom, 26 feet. Length of the dipper handle, 17 feet. Three engines as a main engine, a swinging engine, and a thrusting engine. The turn, turn table is 7 feet 5 inches in diameter and the swinging gear teeth were cut from a solid piece. The boiler is a locomotive type side opening, has a 500 gallon steel water tank, 1900 pounds capacity coal bunker. the house completely down. We'll be uh, dropping the slings off here shortly. As you can see, there's some uh, st stuff falling out of the back of the house. That's uh, some coal ash. There's a gentleman up in there that must be in a hurry because he wants to get the grates cleaned. There you can see the unburned coal clinkers, ashes on the ground. This is the third load being backed up. This uh, one is the boom and the dipper. We have the slings in place to raise the boom and the dipper. It has to be so it's all completely balanced, so it isn't heavy one way or the other. It took multiple times to do this.
Here's a picture of uh, getting the slings ready. As you can see, we are now lifting it up. We have a pretty good balance. The trailer still has a few pieces of the steam shovel on it. The first piece is the coal bunker, which fits on the left side. There's some rough tin. We have a guide rope onto the dipper to kind of control it. Now we are moving the boom and the dipper to hook it up to the house. We just use the, the 175 ton crane for this purpose. The boom is held on by two pins, so this has to fit just about exact. As you can see, Bill Rudisill is getting ready to put one of the pins in. We'll be lowering it down here a little bit more. The part that Bill is standing on right now is one of the stabilizer rods that eventually will we'll be hooked up. As you can see we're having just a little bit of trouble. The hole that you see there, that's the hole for one of the pins. There's also a clevis hanging down which will go to the stabilizer arm. It appears that it's being kind of a pesky thing. Here we are trying to wiggle the, the boom and the dipper back and forth a little bit. Trying to help out and uh, so we're able to get the pin in. Here we have a picture of the part of the smokestack being hoisted up. That was taken off for uh, transportation. You can see off to the left of the screen there's a white water tank. Uh, they're getting ready to start filling the boiler in a holding tank with water. So once this is all assembled that we can have steam built up so we can move it, try out the controls, 
to make sure everything is working. The catwalk on the right side was removed for transportation. This is uh, Wimpy Anderson from Moorhead. He is welding the catwalk back on. The bottom of the catwalk is approximately six foot off the ground. Where you can, there's a picture of uh, smoke coming out the smokestack. We have a fire going in the boiler, trying to build steam up, which will take a fair amount of time. This is a cover being put on or that will cover up a spot in the top of the house, is, will, which is where the cables run in for the boom and the dipper. There we're blowing down steam. Here's the safety valve going off, so it must mean we have a full head of steam. We are just reattaching some tin work that come loose during transportation. Here's the boom all in place. Some cable hanging down which has to be threaded. And as you can see in the background, it looks like this has had a problem once or twice where it's been welded, re-welded, and then welded some more. And it appears that they used uh, what looks like greater blade cutting edges. And here's some more. Uh, this was uh, this shovel was used in a limestone quarry, so it's uh, it's had a fair amount of use. And with a little roughness and some weak spots, you end up uh, having to have to fix things once in a while. Here's the other side of the boom. You can see that had the same problem where they reinforced it. This is a picture of the rear drive axle. As you can see, it looks like it has dents in it, but that is hammered. It is not something that was machined. It was probably put in a forge, pounded somewhat round, which for the most part probably didn't make a whole lot of difference. Here's a view of the, some of the control levers, the operator's uh, station. Here's a picture of the, uh, would be the booms, or I should say the dipper engine. Here uh, we can see where we have, we have the cables already strung for raising the boom. Now we are getting ready to uh, run the cable to raise the dipper. As you can see the cable is moving very slowly. The 
cable I believe is about a 7 8 or a 1 inch cable so it's fairly stiff and you can see up on top now it's jumped off the top shiv Here you can see the boom which has been raised. The boom was laying pretty flat in the process of uh, assembly so now we have to raise it up so we're able to uh, raise the dipper up. The cable's tight. There she goes. You can see the dipper being raised. What a beautiful sight. It is now all as assembled. We'll make sure that everything is working properly. There it just made its first steps at Western Minnesota Steam Thrashers Reunion at Rolog. Here you can see Bill Rudisill at the controls. He is driving it forward. This machine moves very slowly. When this was in its uh, in the days that it was being used, most of the time when they wanted to move this any distance it was probably loaded on a railroad flat car and moved it wasn't driven because this probably makes a quarter to a half mile an hour here we have a, a D7 cat backed up or we will be hooking a chain up to help steer the 50B it is quite a process to uh, make this thing turn there's a hub in the back that you have to loosen up and pull off and stick a railroad tie in to block the drive wheel. So uh, as opposed to doing this repeatedly, we decided to hook a cat on and just put, pull it a little bit to the side to help steer it a little bit. We have quite a long chain here. One of the reasons is is to keep the operator on the cat away from the boom and the dipper if it should <laughs> drop. <laughs> that would be one big owie. There is a picture of uh, the cat pulling a uh, steam shovel. You can see it leaves uh, some tracks in the ground because it's, uh, it's working. This uh, steam shovel dry weight is approximately 120,000 pounds. Uh, full of water and a bunker full of coal is approximately 125,000 pounds. 
We're coming up to the railroad tracks down at Roll Log. We'll pull it up so far and then we'll have to rechain. This is Jim Bryden up on top checking the weather. <laughs> or he's just trying to get a free ride, a, a bird's eye view. I, I Here you can see a, uh, a wire, it's a telephone wire that stopped us for a few minutes. It has to be uh, raised up and over the boom. Here's uh, Jim getting a stick, which he'll take and use to uh, lift the wire over. Here we have gotten up to the railroad tracks. We are hooked from pulling it on the right side. We will be hooking up to pull it on the left side to help steer this. We have a right hand turn to make here, which is fairly sharp. And as you can see here, this old D7 is just a scratching for all she's worth trying to help the steam shovel get turned. Here you can see where the, the old D7 is turning up quite a bit of dirt. Is that 
Oh yeah, there is a hose. Here we decided to take and uh, wet down the corner, make one side so it was muddy to make it uh, slide basically in the mud. We just keep wetting the, the road down and with the cat tied on the chain this will help turn it. Here's where the hoisting engine, which is what propels uh, the steam shovel, you can see it's uh, blowing quite a bit of smoke. Here's where we stop to probably take and fire it uh, a little more. Here uh, Larry is uh, firing the boiler with uh, wood. When we move this after we got it all reassembled, we do not burn any coal, we just burnt wood. The coal bunker fits on the side where the wood blocks were laying or pieces of wood. And that needed some repair and we decided not to put it on until that was repaired. Here's one corner of that we had uh, quite a bit of trouble with. As you can see, the steam shovel is leaning a little bit one way, which always made it want to drift that way. This corner probably took us the longest to make of, of the whole day 
when we were moving this. Here's a picture of uh, the 50B being pulled inside the shed. This will be the first time it's been inside of a house, so to say, since about 1951. We dug out the end of this shed so it was capable of uh, dry, so we were capable of bringing the 50B inside a, a building to keep it under cover for the winter. You can see in the background there where we dug it down, uh, the door side was probably dug down at least two feet deep. You can see the steam cylinder on the one big sprocket there. That's the cylinder that runs the trip for the bucket. That is steam operated. And that's what uh, will tip the lip and we're dumping into a dump wagon, um, truck or whatever. This is Jim Bryden and uh, Bill Rudisill. That's Mark Hamry. I think we're all a little happy that the, the day is done. We started assembling this uh, steam shovel approximately 8 o'clock in the morning. And this is approximately 4.30 in the afternoon. It was a long, hard day, but every bit of it was well worth it. We are real uh, happy to have Bill Rudisill uh, donate this shovel to uh, Western Minnesota Steam Thrashers Reunion. Uh, it is one of the largest, it is the largest steam shovel still in existence, a, has a coal-fired boiler that's totally operational. There is another one out in California, but it's only on static display. This is uh, the dipper being tripped. This is going into the Euclid dump wagon. The next uh, picture coming up is uh, the Lynn truck owned by Bill Rudisill being loaded. Here's the boiler up at Larson Welding. We did have to do some boiler repair in, in the firebox. And we put also redid the smoke ring in the front of the uh, boiler, as you can see right here. The boiler is all fixed and all done. It's ready to be installed back in the 50B. It's all up to code, been all inspected. We'd like to thank, uh, there was approximately 15 people that helped do this project and to help repair it to get it back into satisfactory condition. This is the bottom view of the firebox. For further information, you can call 701-232-4484 and ask for Kelly for more information or you can take a look at Rolog.com. The uh, originally sold brand new for $22,500. <clears throat> it operated from 1928 to 1951. It was used in a limestone quarry. The year of 1951 it was brought in to be rebuilt for the next working year, but the people that owned this decided to buy a diesel powered shovel. It sat from approximately 1951 till 1992 when Bill Rudisill bought the steam shovel and brought it to his place at Petersburg, Kentucky. The next few minutes of video are a preview of what's at the show already. We expect many more pieces of construction equipment to be brought in by Showtime. A video will be produced at the show about the equipment on display in the construction area. It will be available approximately the 1st of November 2004.
The By Cyrus Company supplied 77 out of the 101 steam shovels used in the building of the Panama Canal. In addition, they supplied two 15-yard dipper dredges, a railroad pile driver, a 75-ton and a 100-ton wrecking machine. In 1909, 66 95-ton By Cyrus shovels were used at one time at Calabra. They started at a nine-mile cut and worked themselves to the other end. They were digging at seven different levels while seven sets of railroad tracks hauled the earth and rock. During the peak of the dig, 160 trains ran each day. A 95-ton by Cyrus shovel excavated 4,823 cubic yards of material classified as rock and earth in 5 hours and 20 minutes. The same shovel, known in the official language of the commission as number 213, held the excavating in 26 days 70,290 cubic yards of material, enough to fill a line of ordinary two-yard dump wagons reaching 200 miles. In 1907, the railroad established an agricultural town called Wolf Butte, North Dakota, later renamed to Dolan, and finally renamed by Cyrus, after a steam shovel that was sitting nearby when they were trying to think of a name for the town. A post office was opened in 1908, and by 1930 there were 124 residents. Today there are 20 peop people left, and by Cyrus is in Adams County, just northwest of Henninger. The 50B was delivered on three flat rail cars and assembled on site. It was operated by the stone quarry from May of 1929 until 1951. In 1951, the boiler was completely renovated and prepared for the next year's service. However, this decision was made to replace the steam shovel with a diesel-powered shovel. The boiler has not been fired since the 1951 renovation. However, in 1982, it was certified for possible display and operation at the Knoxville, Tennessee World's Fair. It was to serve as an example of steam power. The shovel did not go to the show, though, as the cost of moving the machine there and back was too much. The shovel remained in its spot next to the Kentucky Virginia Stone Company shop from the spring of 1951 until June of 1994. In June of 1994, it was purchased by Bellevue Sand and Gravel, Incorporated of Petersburg, Kentucky. Bill Rudisill, owner of Bellevue Sand and Gravel, has been in the earth moving business since he was 16. After obtaining the shovel, he restored it to working order. A few members from Western Minnesota Steam Thrashers Union went down to look at it and to see it operate down in Petersburg, Kentucky. Bill and his wife, Mary Sue, made a donation of the 50B to Western Minnesota Steam Thrashers Reunion so that it could be seen and enjoyed. Not many wives can say they have a one-of-a-kind steam shovel named after them. It was transported to its new home at Rolog, Minnesota during the summer of 2003, where it will be working, moving dirt every Labor Day weekend, just like it did in its heyday. A tribute to the grand shovels and the people that built our roads, railroad beds, dug dams, and moved mountains during the 20th century. The Bicyrus Erie 50B has made its last move and is now at home at Rolog, Minnesota. The Western Minnesota Steam Thrashers Reunion would like to say a big thank you to Mary Sue and Bill Rudisill of Petersburg, Kentucky. The shovel was named after Mary Sue as most shovels were named after some person, place, or item. At first, Mary Sue didn't care for this, but as time has gone by, has grown to like the name of a shovel being named after her. <laughs>